Today in the workshop, we'll be working with LoRa. You'll see how this amazing radio system works and how we can use inexpensive LoRa modules with an Arduino Uno, Raspberry Pi Pico, and ESP32. We'll also build a remote data gathering system with a remarkable range. We're going the distance today, so welcome to the workshop. Well, hello and welcome to the workshop and today we're going to be working with an absolutely amazing radio technology called LoRa. Now LoRa is a low cost, low power technology that uses an unlicensed band to send small bits of data over very large distances. With LoRa you don't necessarily need to measure the distances between devices using meters or yards. You can use kilometers or miles. It's that good. Now today I am going to show you how you can use some very inexpensive LoRa modules with some common microcontrollers and we'll be using an Arduino Uno, we'll be using a Raspberry Pi Pico, and we'll also be using an ESP32. We'll be programming those microcontrollers using both C++ and MicroPython so you can see how versatile it is to work with LoRa. So let me begin today's video by telling you a little story about why you would want to use LoRa instead of Wi-Fi or Bluetooth in your next IoT project. Now let's say that you're an experimenter and you live in a nice orange house right beside a nice green tree and you decide to wire IoT sensors into your house. You use Wi-Fi and connect a number of IoT devices throughout your house and it works pretty well although in some of the remote regions of your house the signal is a bit weak. You then decide to add some sensors to the outside of your house and the ones that you place near your home still get a reasonable signal. However, the sensors you have out by the nice green tree don't get enough signal at all. Now, if our experimenter was to switch their system to using LoRa instead of Wi-Fi, they'd find that they get a full signal throughout their home, as well as outside, including outside by the nice big green tree. But that LoRa signal can travel even further. It can travel out to the nice red barn, and beyond the nice red barn into the field. And in addition, the LoRa devices consume so little power that they can use alternate energy sources such as solar energy. LoRa is a low-powered, long-range radio system. It uses spread spectrum modulation, and this makes it resilient to noise and interference. Because of this, LoRa systems can have a range of 15 kilometers or 9 miles in rural areas, but the range can be much further than that. In fact, the world record for LoRa at the moment is 832 kilometers or 517 miles. It was set in the Netherlands using a balloon. LoRa has very low power consumption. The data rate of LoRa is only 300 to 50,000 bits per second, and this rate can be dynamically adjusted. LoRa is best suited for small bursts of low bandwidth data. LoRa has built-in encryption, so your data is safe. One of the best features of LoRa is that it uses an unlicensed radio band, the Industrial Scientific and Medical, or ISM band. The frequency allocation for the ISM band is different in different parts of the world and you should check to make certain that you're using the correct frequencies for your area. In addition, the 2.4 GHz band can be used worldwide. Within each of these frequency bands, there are a number of different channels allocated for both uplinks and downlinks. Here is the channel allocated for the North American frequency band of 902 to 928 MHz. This is commonly referred to as the 915 MHz band. The spread spectrum technology used by LoRa allocates its entire bandwidth, so nothing is wasted. This makes it exceptionally resistant to noise and multipath distortion. Multipath distortion occurs when a signal bounces off of something and arrives at a different time. If you remember the old analog television, this was perceived as ghosts in your picture. LoRa makes use of CSS or Chirp Spread Spectrum Modulation. CSS uses chirp signals for data transmission. A chirp is a signal that changes frequency rapidly. It embeds information within these chirps. The illustration over here shows a chirp with a frequency increase, and this is called an up chirp. 
In this illustration, we see a chirp with a frequency decrease, and this is called a down chirp. The duration and bandwidth of a chirp are unique and distinct. Because they are unique, they are very distinguishable below the noise floor, and this is what gives LoRa its incredible distance capabilities. Multiple LoRa devices will use different chirp variations to distinguish themselves. LoRa also adjusts the spreading factor and the number of chirps used. When discussing LoRa, the topic of LoRaWAN will inevitably come up. It's important to realize the distinction between the two. LoRa describes the physical layer of the transmission. It describes things such as the hardware, as well as the software used to directly interact with that hardware. LoRaWAN describes the communication protocol and network architecture that uses this hardware. We can use a standard data diagram to illustrate the relationship between LoRaWAN and LoRa. In this diagram, the application layer is on the very top. Below the application layer sits the MAC layer, and this is the layer that is serviced by LoRaWAN. Below the MAC layer is the physical layer, and the physical layer is what is serviced by LoRa. In a typical LoRaWAN setup, the LoRa devices are called nodes, and these nodes can be connected to other devices called gateways. A node can connect to more than one gateway, and you can have more than one node connection to a gateway. All the connections between the end nodes and the gateways are performed using LoRa radio signals. Now the gateways are connected to a network server, and that network server, in turn, is connected to a number of application servers. These application servers can drive the various applications that the end nodes are servicing. Note that the connection on this side is all done by TCP IP and is a standard internet connection that can either be wired or wireless. But we don't need to concern ourselves with all that at the moment because today we're just going to focus on LoRa. We're going to do some very basic experiments using two different nodes or devices. We'll also do an experiment using a controller and multiple devices as well. We'll be making use of a couple of very inexpensive LoRa modules, and we'll also be using some very common microcontrollers. So now let's get started with LoRa. Now the experiments that we're going to be doing today are all based around really the same module, the RFM95 module by Hope RF. I've got that module in a couple of different forms over here. Now here's the Hope RF module itself, and you can get these things on eBay and Amazon. They're really inexpensive and uh, they're very common. Now the one thing you'll notice first off about this module is how tiny it is. In fact, if I place this row of standard header pins against it, you can see that it's even tinier than the standard headers. So you can't just solder on pins onto this and expect to use it on a solderless breadboard. So there's a couple of solutions for that. The first one is to jury rig it yourself, and that's what I did over here. This is basically just a piece of perf board, and I've soldered it onto the perf board, and on the back of the perf board you can see I've got all the wires over here from the Hope RF module to a bunch of pins, and this actually works pretty well. I've got a wire antenna on it, and I'm going to be using this in one of my demonstrations today. But a nicer way of doing it is to use this. Now this is a little board that I picked up on DigiKey, it's actually made by Pi Maroni, and uh, this board allows you just to put the module on top of the board, and as it has castellated pins, you can just solder it, and you end up with something that looks like this. And this is a much nicer module to use than the uh, homemade one that I had, and it's got all the pins labeled out for you and everything. So that's a really easy way to use that. Now, I understand SparkFun also makes these with the module already soldered onto a board. I wasn't able to obtain those, but you might be able to. Now, the other solution I'm using is from Adafruit, and it's actually the same module, but they've got the module on a breadboard uh, compatible uh, board over here. Although when I say breadboard compatible, take it with a grain of salt. It's very wide over here, but I'll show you some solutions for using it with a solderless breadboard because it's not going to fit on a standard breadboard properly. Now this module has a couple of advantages.
advantage is the first one as I said is that the pins are spaced 0.1 of an inch so it's uh, more compatible with the stuff that we're using but also it has a regulator on it a 3.3 uh, .3 volt regulator so it can be used with anything from 3 to 6 volts whereas the Hope RF module over here can only be used with 3.3 .3 volts another thing about it is it has logic level converters so it's uh, compatible with any type of logic and that's really handy now you'll notice it doesn't have any pins on it you have the side of the pins you also have to figure out the antenna connection which is over here and there's a couple of things you can do for that you can solder a little antenna connector onto it and i've got one down here that i've done you can take a look at my handiwork over here i soldered one of those on another thing you can do is what i did with the other module and just put a piece of wire onto it so you can handle that either way and the modules are essentially interchangeable except of course for the voltage thing on the adafruit module so uh, you want to pay attention to that now there are other common modules out there that you can probably use with the same code if they have an spi interface chances are they will probably work as well now one very important consideration in any LoRa installation is the antenna that you're going to use. It can really make a difference in the range that you're going to get. Now it is imperative that you do use an antenna even if it's just a piece of wire. You should never run a LoRa module without an antenna connected to it. You can actually damage the module. I've got a few here that you can choose from. This is a pretty standard type of a LoRa antenna. You'll find a lot of these things are available in a lot of places including Amazon and sometimes they're even included with the adapters and they're very tiny they have an SMA connector on them and you can extend this type of a thing with a piece of SMA coax and that's very readily available as well if you want to mount the antenna distant from the receiver uh, this is another very tiny antenna it's meant to go into a very tiny case that I'll be showing you in a few moments but it certainly is not that big at all and this of course is the module we used earlier the Adafruit module and as you can see I've got a piece of wire on it and that's quite sufficient as an antenna but it can't just be any length of wire the length of the wire you use is dependent upon the frequency that you're using and so as I'm using 915 megahertz my wire is just a little bit over three inches and you can see from this chart what length of wire you would need to use depending on the operating frequency of your LoRa now if you want to go full-fledged you can take a look at an antenna like this this is an outdoor antenna it comes with a big piece of coax over here it even comes with mounting brackets and this is of course the thing that you would use if you're setting up some sort of a repeater or some sort of a metropolitan area network or something or just want to experiment as I do with uh, using a fancy antenna with LoRa uh, so as you can see there's a wide variety of antennas make certain though that at least you use a piece of wire don't ever run these devices without an antenna now I want to show you another LoRa radio module. It's not one that we're going to be using in our experiments today. It's one that you'll see in a future episode of the DroneBot Workshop when we discuss LoRa WAN. And this is from Seed Studio. It's called the LoRa E5. And it's actually a very nice little module. It's supposed to outperform the Hope RF module, although in the tests I'm doing, they really both performed as great. Now this has a couple of differences in the Hope RF module. One one thing you can see is that you don't need to solder this module it uses what they call the Grove connection system and that's something that Seed Studio uses for a lot of its products in fact I've got a system set up over here right now with a little development board it's got a Seeduino Shao on it and the development board has an OLED display and it's connected with a few Grove connectors one to our um, LoRa module and the other one to a temperature and humidity module and this is running on something called the Things Network which I'll explain to you a little bit more in depth when we talk about LoRa WAN. Another difference in this module is that it basically is treated like a modem. It uses a serial interface and our other module is serial of course it's SPI but this one uses a UART interface and it actually is treated like a modem. You just use the AT command set to control this module. So it's a really neat uh, little device and you'll be seeing this again in a future episode of the DroneBot Workshop. 
And one last piece of equipment that we're going to be using in a future episode of DroneBot Workshop. This is a bit different than everything else we've seen so far because this is not just a LoRa radio module. It's actually a microcontroller that has LoRa built into it. This is the Helltech ESP32 LoRa board. And as you can see, it's actually a very nice little assembly with a built-in OLED display. It uh, uses USB-C, which is very nice. And uh, if you turn it over down here, you'll see there's a little connector that is for a LiPo battery, a 3.7 volt LiPo that you can power the board off of. And it also will recharge through the USB-C. So it's really nice all-in-one solution. And for a real all-in-one solution, you can also order it with this little case. And with this case, you can put the board into here. It's got... Uh, place on the bottom here so you can get at the LiPo and at all the GPIO pins. It uses that really tiny little antenna that I showed you earlier. It's got a top on it with a bezel and this will attach to the two buttons on the board. So you've got a complete LoRa on the go kind of uh, setup over here. So that's a very nice option. Right here you can see it running right now. It's running something called Meshtastic and again I will explain what Meshtastic is in a future episode but it's got this little antenna connected to it and uh, a very visible OLED display. So it's a really nice module and you'll be seeing more of this in a future episode of the DroneBot Workshop. So now that we have the fundamentals of LoRa down and we've looked at a few LoRa devices, it's time to begin working with this amazing technology. We're going to take two of the Adafruit modules as well as a couple of Arduino Unos and do some basic LoRa experiments. We'll be programming with the Arduino IDE using C++ and we'll be making use of a really amazing library, the LoRa library, which makes working with LoRa about as easy as writing to the serial monitor. Now the LoRa library by Sandeep Mystery is available on GitHub and is also available within the Arduino IDE Library Manager. Here we are on the GitHub page and you can see the components of the library. You can also take a look at the compatible hardware and you can see that it works with a number of different LoRa boards and so not just the one that we're using today. So this is a pretty good library for many of your LoRa experiments. Now if you want to find out how to use the library, go into the api.md and that shows you how you include the library at the beginning, pretty simple. And how we do a begin with the frequency that we have to set up in, this, in the setup. And how we set the pins that we're using for our LoRa module. And now this tells you how to send data. So you can begin a packet over here with begin packet or begin packet with an implicit number. How we write data to the packet and how we end data from the packet. Also, there are some callbacks, uh, some transmit and receive callbacks, as well as some packet parsing we can do. So there's a lot of good information up over here. So let's get that library installed and start using it with our Arduino IDE. Now, before we can start working with any of our experiments, we're going to need to install the LoRa library into our Arduino IDE. So go into your library manager and simply type LoRa into the filter. And you'll come back with a number of different libraries. Now, if you scroll a little bit over here, you'll find the one we want, LoRa by Sandeep Mystery. And this one has already been installed on mine. If you haven't installed it, of course, you'll click the install button and then you'll have the library and the library comes with a number of sample files you can look at as well. We'll be basing our first LoRa experiments on the Adafruit RFM9 modules. Now, if you want 868 or 915 megahertz, you'll want an RFM95. And if you'd like 433 megahertz, you'll need an RFM96. Otherwise, the connections and the operation are identical. Now, these are frequency shift keying packet radios. They have a power output of up to 100 milliwatts, and they consume anywhere between 50 and 150 milliamps for a transmission. They'll also consume 30 milliamps during a receive. They use an SPI connection and these modules can operate from anywhere from 3.3 to 6 volt DC and they'll take 150 milliamps of current. They're also both 3.3 and 5 volt logic safe so this is an ideal module to use with 5 volt logic devices like we're going to be using today. We're going to be pairing our module with an Arduino Uno. 
we're also going to require a push button switch. This is just a normally open momentary contact switch. We'll need an LED, any color of LED will do, and a dropping resistor for the LED. Now, if you're using the original Uno, this can be any value from 150 to 470 ohms. But if you're using the new R4 Uno, you'll want to keep it at 330 ohms or higher. We'll begin by connecting the 5 volts from the UNO to the V-in pin on the module. We'll connect the ground connection from the UNO to a ground connection on the module. Pin 3 of the Arduino UNO will be connected to the G0 output. This is the interrupt output of the module. Pin 13 will be connected to SCK, pin 12 to MISO, and pin 11 to MOSI. We'll connect pin 4 to the CS or chip select lead, and pin 2 of the Arduino Uno will be connected to the reset pin on the LoRa module. We'll connect pin 8 of the Arduino Uno to one side of our push button switch. The other side of the push button switch will be connected to ground. Arduino Uno pin 5 will be connected to one side of our dropping resistor, and we'll connect the other side of the dropping resistor to the anode of our LED. We'll connect the cathode of the LED to the ground. And one very important connection is an antenna. You should never use the module without an antenna, so you'll need to hook up an appropriate antenna to your module. Now remember, you're going to need to build two of these circuits to follow our experiments. So build them both, and now we'll look at some code we can use to exchange messages between them using LoRa. Now we're going to begin our LoRa experiments with a very simple demonstration that just sends data packets between one device and another. You're going to have to designate one of your Arduinos as being the sender and the other one as being the receiver. And here's the code you're going to run on the sender. Now it's actually pretty simple. We're going to start off by including the required libraries and we need the SPI library which is built into your Arduino IDE and the LoRa library which we just installed. Next, we need to define a couple of the connections that we're using to the LoRa module because they aren't the standard connections as far as the library is concerned. And then we define a byte that we call the message count, and we're just going to use this as a counter. Now in setup, we'll set up our serial monitor, and then we'll go and we'll do a setup for LoRa. And this is where we use set pins and apply those pins that we gave it here earlier. And over here is where we begin LoRa, and this is where you're going to have to make certain you've got the right number in over here. This is the value you'd use for North American frequencies for 915 megahertz. But if you're in a different part of the world, you're going to need to use a different value for this. So make certain that you use the correct one for your area. After that, we go into the loop. The loop's pretty simple. We print to the serial monitor, and then we send our LoRa packet. Look how simple it is to do that. We just begin the packet, and a LoRa print prints out to LoRa, so this prints out the contents of the packet, and then we end the packet. It's as simple as that. We increment the message counter, put in a five-second delay because we don't want to send these messages too often, and repeat the process. So it's pretty simple. We'll load this up to the first Arduino, and and now we'll look at the sketch that we're going to need on the receiver side. Now on the receive side, the sketch is almost as simple as the transmit one was. We start off by including the same libraries and defining the pins to the LoRa module. Our setup is pretty well identical. We start the serial monitor. We set the pins on the LoRa module. Over here we do a begin, and so once again, make certain that you have the correct value for your location over here. And then we move on to the loop. Now in the loop we are receiving and we're trying to parse a packet, so we uh, take a look at the packet size over here. If the packet size is greater than zero, then we do indeed have a packet, and so we begin here. We'll print that we've received the packet, and then while the packet's available, we're going to print the actual data within the packet, and we do that right over here. And then we print the RSSI, which is a signal strength, and then we end the loop and keep doing it. So this is again a very simple sketch that we can use to demonstrate how we can do simple transmissions with LoRa. So load this up to the second Arduino and we'll go and demonstrate it. And so here's our LoRa demonstration. Now in this demonstration, the unit with the green solderless breadboard is my sender unit, and the one with the red solderless breadboard is the receiver 
unit. And you'll notice I use two of these little mini breadboards put together in order to hold the module because that module is very wide and it won't fit on a standard breadboard. I'll be showing you another solderless breadboard a little later on that you can also use with these modules. And as you can see from the serial monitor, it seems to be working. We're sending packets out of one side and we're receiving them on the other side with a very strong signal strength, but that makes perfect sense as our modules are literally just a few centimeters apart. I'm going to try to cut the signal strength down a little bit, maybe put this little piece of steel in between the two. Not sure if that's going to help or not. And it did reduce it by a little bit. Maybe if I went this way. Oh yeah, it reduced the RSSI quite uh, a bit by doing that, so I'm blocking some of the signal. Nonetheless, a lot of signal is getting through, and of course this demonstration would probably be a lot more interesting if I could separate these two units by a bit, but it does serve to prove that it's quite easy to send LoRa packets using the Arduino Uno. So now that we proved that we can indeed send data between our two Arduinos using LoRa, let's expand upon that and control the LED with a push button. We're going to use the push button on the transmitter to control the LED on the receiver, and this is a one-way conversation at the moment. So our sketch on the sender side is going to start off the same as we always have with the two included libraries, and by defining our pins, we're going to define our message counter. We've got a couple of other variables over here, and this is for the push button. The button pin, which is the actual pin we're physically connected to, and the button state, the state of the push button, whether it's been pressed or not pressed. In setup, it's almost the same. We have the addition of the push button, so we have to put a pin mode in there, and we're using the internal pull-up, so we didn't have to use a pull-up resistor. After that, it's essentially the same as it is before. Once again, remember to always have the correct frequency over here. Then we go into the loop, and in the loop we're going to take a look at the state of the push button to see if it's been pressed. And so the button state is just going to be a digital read on the button pin itself. Now if the button is pressed, that will go low. So if it is low, we know the push button has been pressed, and we'll send a packet. And our packet is really simple again. We're going to do a begin packet. We're going to do a print, and this is the contents of the packet. And the packet's just going to say button pressed. We're going to literally send that text out. And then we're going to end the packet. We're going to increment our message counter and print out the message count. And then we're going to add a half a second delay, and that's to debounce the push button. And we'll go back and do it again in the loop. So we're only sending packets out if we happen to press the push button. So it's a pretty simple sketch. Load this one up to the transmitter, and now we'll take a look at the one for the receiver. And now we come to the receive side of our push button control. And so we start off this sketch uh, the usual way with the two libraries and by defining our pins. We have some additional variables here. We have an integer that represents the LED pin that we've got our LED connected to. We have a string called contents, which is an empty string to start, and that's the contents of our received message. A string called button press, and it's literally the text button pressed, because that's what we're looking for for the transmitter. So if you decide to change your transmit sketch to send something else, you'll need to modify this part as well. And then a boolean that is the receive button state, and this will tell us whether the button on the other end is indicating an off or an on. Now, in setup, we go pretty well basically the same thing. The only difference is we have to set a pin mode for the LED pin, which is, of course, an output. The rest of this is the same as we've seen before. Again, we have to make certain we have the same right frequency over here. And then we'll go into the loop. And for the loop, you'll notice a lot of this is the same as our previous receive sketch. We take a look to see if we can parse a packet. And if we do get a packet, we'll print out that we received it. And we'll read the packet. And we'll print out the packet and the RSSI values to our serial monitor. And now we come down to the button. Now, button state is going to indicate whether the LED is on or off. And so we're going to toggle it every time we receive one of these signals. So we're going to make the button state the inverse of what it is right now. So if it's high, we're going to make it low. If it's low, we're going to make it high. And then with that, we're going to drive the LED. We'll take a look at the button state, and if it is indeed high, then we're going to drive the LED by turning that pin high and printing to the serial monitor that it is on. Otherwise, we'll turn the pin low and print that it is off. 
and we finish everything by clearing out the contents and then we do it all over again so once again it's a pretty simple sketch load it up to the receive side and let's see if we can control our led with the remote transmitter all right so here's a demonstration of the LoRa remote control now this device over here is the sender device and this is the receiver device over here and I've also got the serial monitors open for both devices. So if I press the button on the sender, you can see the serial monitor says it sent a packet. The other end says it received the packet. The button was pressed and the LED is on, which indeed it is. And if I press it again, it'll toggle everything off. And I can continue to do so. And we can continue to observe it on both the LED and the serial monitor. So this is a pretty simple little circuit and a pretty simple sketch, but it is the basis for a basic remote control. And of course, instead of controlling an LED, you could control anything really that you could turn on and off with a microcontroller using LoRa. Now, the two experiments that we've done so far have sent data just in one direction, from a transmitter to a receiver. But of course, we can send LoRa data in both directions, and that's why I've got push buttons and LEDs on each of the Arduinos. We'll be able to control the other Arduino's LED with our push button by sending data in both directions. Now, we're going to make use in our sketch of something called a callback function, and we've seen this in other radio systems before. A callback is something that is initiated whenever data is received. It's kind of like an interrupt and in fact we're going to treat it just like an interrupt. If you recall the connection from the module to the Arduino, there was a connection from an I.O. pin on the module that went to a pin on the Arduino that had to be interrupt capable and that's because the library treats this callback as an interrupt and so we'll write code for it the same way. We'll write a function that needs to get executed every time we receive data and attach it to that callback. So let's go and take a look at the code now that we're going to use to send data two ways between our Arduinos using LoRa. Now for our two-way communications demonstration, we're going to run the same sketch on both devices, although there is a small change that you can make to each device, and I'll show you that in a moment. We start the sketch off the usual way with the same libraries and defining our pins. We define a number of variables, many of which you'll recognize from the previous sketches that we do. Out message is our outbound message. Uh, down over here is where you might want to do some modifications. Now we're going to define the local address, that's our address address and we'll define the address of the destination now in this case I've placed FF in here and FF is a broadcast address so if you broadcast this it'll go to any destination but you can change this and what you would do is you would have opposite parameters in the two devices so let's say you change this to CC on the other end you would make this CC and this BB if that makes any sense to you the rest of these are the same variables we've seen before now in the setup we do a lot of the usual things. We have an input pull up for our push button and the LED is an output. We'll begin the serial monitor. We'll start off LoRa. We'll set the pins and of course we'll set the correct frequency over here. Now here's where we do something different and you remember we just discussed the callback function. Well here's where we bind it. We do on receive. What do we do? We call the on receive function. We just happen to have named our function the same thing. And so this is like joining an interrupt to a function we're attaching the on receive to this function which we'll look at in a few moments every time we receive data that function will be activated now we place LoRa into a receive mode so we're constantly receiving and we print to the serial monitor that we've initialized successfully now the loop is actually pretty simple and that's because the loop uses a couple of functions so let's go and take a look at the functions first first of all we've got a function to actually send the message so rather than build up the packet inside the loop we're going to call a separate function to do it and you can see there's a lot more in our packet now we're going to write the destination address. Now remember right now the destination is equal to FF, so it's a broadcast address. But if we want to specifically aim it at the other computer, we have to put in its unique address here. We'll also write the sender's address, this is our own address, into the packet, the message count. We'll write the length of the packet in there, and that's because we use this as error checking on the other end to make certain we've received it correctly. 
And then we print the outgoing. Remember, the outgoing variable is actually the contents of our message. And then we end the packet and increment the message count. So that's the send messages function. Now, here's the function we're going to activate every time we get a call back, every time we receive data. It looks very similar to what we saw in our other receive. We, we take a look to see if the packet actually is there and has data in it. If it does have data, we read some of these things like the recipient, the sender, the incoming message ID, and the length from the packet. And we set our string to blank to start off over here. We go through and check a number of things. First of all, we see can we actually get the bytes that we do. We'll read them one at a time. Uh, we'll see if the incoming message length is the same as the message length embedded in the packet. If it isn't, then we know the packet is corrupted and we'll return over here. We'll jump out of the, func out of the function. We also want to make sure we're the correct recipient, so it has to either be us or FF. If it isn't, we'll jump out. But assuming we made it this far, this packet is for us. So we'll print all the details of it to the serial monitor, and then we go through the button toggle function to see if we need to actually toggle our LED on or off like we did before. So all of these functions are called from the loop. So in the loop, we just set the push button state as we did before. And if the um, push button has been pressed, we will compose an out message and send the message and put a delay for debouncing it. And then we put Laura back into a receive mode because otherwise we just want to be receiving. So it's actually a pretty simple sketch. Load this up to both devices. Remember, after you use it, you can play with those addresses. And we'll see if we can control our LEDs in either direction now. And so here's our demonstration of the two-way communications between our two LoRa-enabled devices. And so if I press the yellow push button, you will see the yellow LED on the other device illuminate, and the blue push button will illuminate the blue one. And both push buttons will toggle their respective LEDs. And it seems to work pretty well. Of course, I've only got them separated by a few centimeters, but you can separate these by large distances and achieve the same results with your simple LoRa two-way switch. Now, up until this point, all of the work that we've done with LoRa has been with the Arduino IDE and C++, but of course you can work with LoRa using other programming languages. So what we're going to do next is take out a couple of Raspberry Pi Picos, install the MicroPython interpreter on them, and we'll program for LoRa using MicroPython. We're going to take a LoRa library that we can get from GitHub that already has some sample code, and it'll show you how easy it is to use LoRa with MicroPython. It's a essentially as easy as it was using it with C++. So let's get out our Picos and install the MicroPython interpreter onto them. We are going to need to install MicroPython onto our Raspberry Pi Pico, and here's how we do it. To start with, don't connect the Pico up to your computer. Use your computer to go to the MicroPython website and download the latest firmware release of MicroPython for the Raspberry Pi Pico. Once you have the file downloaded, Press and hold the boot cell key on your Pico. Now connect the USB cable from your computer to the Raspberry Pi Pico. You should see a drive appear on your computer screen. Once you see that, you can release the boot cell key. Now copy the file that you downloaded over to that drive. Once the file has been copied, the drive will disappear. You can now disconnect the Raspberry Pi Pico and put it on the solderless breadboard so that we can wire it up. Once again, we're going to be using the Adafruit RFM 9X module. We'll begin by connecting the VIN pin on the module to the 3.3 volt output of the Raspberry Pi Pico. We'll connect the module's ground to the Pico's ground. Module pin G0 will be connected to Pico pin GP28. The SCK pin will be connected to Pico pin GP6. MISO will go to GP4. MOSI will go to GP7. The CS or chip select pin will be connected to GP5 on the Raspberry Pi Pico. And finally, we'll connect the reset pin to GP27. Once again, make certain that you've got an antenna connected to your module. And now we're ready to begin working with LoRa in MicroPython. 
Now for our MicroPython experiments, we're going to be using a library that we can grab on GitHub, and it's the ULaura library by Martin Wheeler. Now download the library, and you will find there are three relevant files in it. I'll show you them here. There's a ULaura Pi file, and that file needs to be copied to both of the Raspberry Pi Picos. Then when you go into examples, you'll find there are two files, client.py and server.py. On one of the Picos, you're going to place client PY along with the ULaura library. On the other one, you'll place server.py. So you'll have one machine with the client in the ULaura library and the other machine with the server in the ULaura library. Don't make a subdirectory, put both of the files into the same directory. If you're looking for an easy way to copy files onto the Raspberry Pi Pico, just simply use the Thani IDE, open the file up from your computer, and then save the file onto the Raspberry Pi Pico. Now here's the script that we're going to be using on the server side. Now remember we've copied both server.py and ulaura.py, which is the library, to our Raspberry Pi Pico. And so this is server.py. We started off by importing sleep from the time library, and that's pretty common when we want to put a delay in our program. We also import from that ulaura library that we loaded, and we import a couple of different functions. We'll be looking at this one in a moment. Uh, then we have a callback function. Now, if you recall from our C++ script, we used a callback, the callback being activated every time we receive data. And the same concept is true in MicroPython. So our callback function is just going to do a number of prints. It's going to say who it's from, the address, which in this case will be the client address received which is the received data so it's going to do the payload message it's also going to print the rssi and snr which is the uh, signal strength and the signal to noise ratio now over here we have the lora parameters and these are the parameters for hooking up the lora module and these are the pinouts that we're using for the lower module now this line over here is where we need to take a look at the library uh, it says the spi bus and it gives the spi bus connections as this so if we go into the library we'll see that's all defined under SPI config. So RP20 defines these four different pins over here. So if you're using a different processor, you're going to want to take a look at that. Or if you want to, and you want to use different pin numbers, you could always add a statement into here, although I don't really know why you'd want to do that. Uh, underneath here is another thing you're going to need to configure though, and that's the frequency. In fact, if you take this out of the box, it's actually set for the European frequency. I've got it set for 915 because I'm in North America, so I use 915 megahertz. So make absolutely certain that you've changed this to the correct value for your location. Now down here, we're going to initialize the LoRa radio. And uh, then we're going to set our callback. The callback function we saw up over here, we'll just establish what it is down here. We continuously listen, so we put everything into continuous listen mode. And then we do a little loop while true will sleep for a tenth of a second. Then this that just lets us do things over and over and over. So we're just going to continually listen. And if the callback is activated, the callback function will print out on the display. So that's a pretty simple application in MicroPython that we can use to use as our LoRa server. And so now we move over to the client script, and this is even simpler than the server script was. It starts off identically. We do the two library imports that we did before from the time in the ULaura library. We set up the LoRa module parameters exactly the same way that we did in the earlier sketch, and we initialize the radio the same as we did in the earlier sketch. In fact, the only different thing that we're doing is we're creating a loop down over here, a while true loop, and we're doing a send. And look how easy it is to send data. It's LoRa, send to wait, and then you send the data and the address you're sending the data to. So that's pretty simple. Then we will just print out sent to let us know that we've sent something. And we're going to go to sleep for 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds, we're going to send out this message to the server side. So it's a very simple script, and it illustrates just how simple it is to use MicroPython with LoRa. Let's load all this up and take a look at it working. 
Now here's my Raspberry Pi Pico along with the Adafruit LoRa adapter and I want you to take note of the solderless breadboard that I've got them on. This is styled a bit differently than a lot of breadboards in that the power rail goes down the center and then you have the common connection rails on the other sides of it. And this allows me to stagger the Adafruit module which as we saw earlier was too wide for a conventional breadboard and get connections to it quite easily. And it's also really good for those large ESP32 and ESP8266 modules as well. So you might look into getting a breadboard like this also. Now uh, I've got the Pico and the LoRa module hooked up and as you can see the LoRa module is just using the wire antenna again. And if we go over to take a look at the IDE, I can look in the shell and you can see that I'm getting some data and the data is coming from the client side. This is the server side. The client side data is not too interesting to look at in the shell. It just basically says sent, sent, sent and every 10 seconds it's going to send me a message. The message Message is this is a test message and on this side I can see I received a byte and it tells me that the byte is this is a test message that's the um, contents of the message the RSSI is the signal strength and the SNR is a signal to noise ratio and so every 10 seconds I get this now the transmit end right now is in my office which is on the other end of the basement so it's not that far away but it's not here in the workshop and so as you can see we can also use micro Python instead of C plus plus to program and work with Laura. And so now it's time for that data gathering project that I alluded to earlier. We're going to take the two Arduino Unos that we already have wired up and we're going to add a DHT22 temperature and humidity sensor to each one of them. Then we will take an ESP32, we'll attach a LoRa module to it. I'm going to use that LoRa module that I hand wired, the Hope RF one, but you could use that or the Arduino module, it doesn't matter. And we're also going to hook an OLED up to the ESP32 to display our temperature and humidity. Now by itself, this is actually a pretty useful device, but what I really want you to get out of this is how it works, because this is the basis for any data gathering project using LoRa. Our ESP32 is going to pull the two different sensors and they're going to return data to it and you could use this for any type of sensor and any type of data gathering so let's begin by looking at the wiring we're going to need for this project and then we'll look at how the code works we're going to be using a different LoRa module for our main station. It's the Hope RF RM95W module that I showed you earlier. This is a very popular LoRa modem module. It has a power output of up to 100 milliwatts and it's sensitive down to negative 148 dBm. This module consumes 10 milliamps when it's receiving. It has an SPI connection as well as a number of GPIO pins. Now this is a 3.3 volt DC device and it can only accept 3.3 volts and it consumes 120 milliamps. It's only a 3.3 volt logic device so do not apply any 5 volt logic directly to it. And one thing about this module is it is not solderless breadboard friendly as the pins are spaced too closely together so you're going to have to come up with some method of wiring it up. Now if you wish you can use the Adafruit module that we've been using for our previous experiments. It's completely compatible and the only difference is the labeling on a few of the pins as illustrated here. With whatever module you decide to use, we're going to be using an ESP32. Now you can use any ESP32 board that you happen to have. You don't need to use the same one I'm using. We'll also be using an OLED display with an I2C connection. We'll begin by connecting the 3V3 or 3.3 volt output of the ESP32 to the 3.3 volt connection on the RFM95W module. We'll connect the ESP32's ground to the module's ground. We'll connect the module's DIO0 pin to GPIO pin 2 on the ESP32. The SCK connection will be going to GPIO pin 18. MISO goes to GPIO 19, MOSI goes to GPIO 23, the NSS pin will go to GPIO pin 5 on the ESP32, and we'll connect the reset pin to GPIO pin 14. Now on our OLED we will connect the ground to the ground of the ESP32, and we'll connect VCC to the 3.3 volt connection. 
We'll also connect the SCL line to GPIO pin 22 and the SDA to GPIO pin 21. And as always, make certain that you have an antenna connected to the module before you proceed. For our remote temperature sensors, we're going to reuse the Arduino Uno circuits that we wired up earlier. Our new circuits will not require the push button, but you can leave it on your board. I'm just going to remove it from the diagram for clarity. We're going to be adding a DHT22 temperature and humidity sensor. This is also known as an AM2302. We'll connect the 5 volt pin of the DHT22 to the Arduino Uno's 5 volt output. The data pin of the DHT22 will be connected to pin 9 of the Arduino Uno, and we'll connect the ground pin of the DHT22 to the Uno's ground. Note that the third pin on the DHT22 has no connection to it, and remember you're going to have to have two of these Arduino Uno circuits to complete our project. Now let's take a look at the way that our controller and sensors are going to work. We have the controller, which is based around an ESP32, and our two sensors, which are based upon an Arduino Uno. The controller will send out a data request to sensor number one, and sensor number one will reply with its temperature and humidity data. Sensor number one will then apply a two second timeout for the DHT22 sensor. The controller will then request data from sensor number two, and it will return data as well and also apply its own two second timeout. Now, if we were to request data while the timeout is still active, the sensor is just going to ignore it. That way, the data that we get is always good because we've applied the two second timeout. Now let's take a look at the remote sensor side, and there are two things we want to examine. The first being the receive callback. The receive callback is very simple, as a callback should be. We receive the LoRa message and decide whether it is for us. If it isn't for us, we'll just exit, but if it is for us, we're going to update the message variable. The message variable is the packet number from the controller. It changes with every transmission to let us know that the controller is requesting new data. And then we're going to exit. Now on the loop side, we're going to check the message variable coming in. That message variable will just simply be a number, and we want to see if it's a new one. If it is, then we've got a new request from the controller. We'll read our DHT sensor, and we'll send out the LoRa message with the sensor values. We'll then apply a two second delay before we go back and check the message variable again. On the controller side, our receive callback is also pretty simple. We'll receive the message and decide if it's for us. If it is, we'll identify the sender. Is it sensor 1 or sensor 2? Once we've identified the sender, we'll update the sensor values and also a timestamp variable that determines whether the data is fresh or not. And then we will exit. On the loop side, we'll read those sensor and time variables. We'll use the time variable to decide if this is a recent value or if it's an old one. If it's an old one, we're going to format the display as being missing data because that means that our receiver has not been responding. However, if it's new, we're going to update the data with the first pattern, and that pattern has the data from sensor 1 in large letters and from sensor 2 in small letters. We'll apply a three second delay, after which we'll make a request to sensor 1 for data. Then we'll update the display pattern with pattern 2, where sensor 2 has the larger text and sensor 1 is smaller, and after a three second delay, we'll make a request to sensor 2 for some more data. Then we'll go and turn around and do it all over again. So by looking at this flowchart, you should be able to understand how our system works. Now let's go and take a look at some code we can use to make it work. Now here's the sketch that we're going to be using on both of the remote units, the Arduino Unos. And the sketch requires you to install another library in addition to the LoRa library, and that's the DHT Lib library by Rob Tillert. Now this is not the normal DHT library, and you can find that easily in your library manager. Just filter by DHT Lib, and here it is over here. So you can install that into your IDE. 
So we're going to include those libraries and we're going to define a pin to connect our DHT22 sensor to. And of course, the LED that we still have is connected to pin 5. We'll create a sensor object for the DHT as well. Then we'll define the pins used by the LoRa module as we've done before. We'll define a message variable for the outgoing message called out message and one for the ingoing message as well. And we'll also have the previous value of the incoming message because the incoming message is just going to be basically the sequence number of the packet. We want to make sure that it has changed so we're going to we're going to record both the old and the new one and a message counter as well <clears throat> now here's the only section of the code that you may need to modify in fact you will need to modify it for one of the units this has address aa we're going to be using aa and bb for our two remote sensors and those are just arbitrary choices so you'll need to set one of these to aa and the other one when you compile it before you do set it to bb so we'll have different addresses now here's the callback function that we're going to be calling up every time we receive a packet we're going to do the normal checks to make certain the packet is okay and we'll come all the way down over here when the packet is fine we're just going to take the in message variable and update it with the incoming data okay and there's another function we have over here for sending the message and we basically just provide it with the outgoing string and we do what we've seen before with laura begin and laura write to send out a packet Okay, in the setup, uh, it's quite simple. We'll set up the serial monitor, set the LED up as an output, and we'll set up the LoRa module. We've seen all this before. We'll set the LoRa module for the correct frequency. Make certain that you do that. We'll attach the callback function to on receive, and we'll place the LoRa module in receive mode. Now, in the loop, what we're going to do is check to make certain that the message coming in is different from the previous one. So we know we're dealing with a new new request and not the old one. If we are, we're going to read the DHT22 sensor and get its values. We're going to print the results in the serial monitor just for fun. We're going to format the outgoing message string, and we're going to send that string as the LoRa packet. So we're going to send that out to the controller, print some stuff again on the serial monitor. We'll update the old message variable to be the current one. We'll place Laura again in receive mode. And then we're going to put it into a two second delay. And the optional bit is if you're not using the LED, you can just put one big long delay here. But otherwise, we're going to turn the LED on during the two second delay. And what that does, it is just gives you a visual indication that the uh, remote unit is actually working. So that's the code loaded up to the remote units. Make sure to change one of them to BB and we'll now look at the controller code. And here's the sketch that we're going to be using on the controller side, the side that has the ESP32. Now we're going to start by including the required libraries and one set of libraries you'll need to get are the Adafruit GFX and the SSD1306 libraries and those are for the OLED displays. You may already have them because they're pretty popular libraries but if not you can just download them through the library manager. Starting off again with the pins used by the LoRa mod module and the source and sensor addresses. Now our local address is 01 and the two sensors, sensor address 1 is AA and address 2 is BB and you'll remember that from the code we use for the remote sensors. Now we have a few parameters for the OLED display and we also define the display itself over here. We set up a couple of temperature and humidity variables for our remote data and we format them like this because this will display on the screen and if we see this we know that we haven't yet got any sensor data because it'll get replaced by actual sensor data. Now we've got a couple of uh, variables for the sensor data, the remote temperature and remote humidity for both 1 and 2. We also have some time variables because we're going to try to do a timeout and make certain our data is fresh. If we go too long without getting data, then we know there's something wrong with the remote sensor. So we've got two timeouts for the two different uh, sensors and we set them to millis which is the current value in millis 
milliseconds since the processor was booted up. And so these are both set to the same thing. We also set an interval in milliseconds and I'm setting mine for 12 and a half seconds. You can change this if you like, but basically if I don't see data from the other end for 12 and a half seconds, and then I probably have not going to get any data. There's something wrong with that remote sensor and I'm going to display an error on the display to indicate that. And again, you can change that time delay if you wish and the message counter like we've used before. Now we have a couple of functions. Now here's our first function called new display and this is for driving the OLED display. It takes the temperature and humidities in from both of them and then display order which is an integer that can be either zero or one. In one order you're going to have sensor one as the main display with sensor two in tiny letters and the other order it'll be the opposite. And so basically uh, we just do a couple of uh, display header stuff first that's common for both of them and then we check to see that last uh, bit if it's a one or a zero. If it's one we're going to set up the display with remote sensor two data in it first and if it's a zero we'll do the same thing with remote sensor one data. So this is basically just a bunch of display commands. Now the next function is to get the value and that just extracts the values from the delimited string because remember we're getting a delimited string in with the temperature and humidity values and so this can just individually distract, uh, extract either the temperature or the humidity. Okay, the on receive function is of course our callback function, which we're getting used to right now. We go through the normal stuff at the beginning to make certain that it's a valid packet and it's meant for us. And if it is, we'll get uh, we'll see if it comes from sensor one or two and we'll take a look at the uh, sensor address if it's remote sensor one then the incoming data is remote data one and the uh, millis value is assigned to the current active so in other words we're refreshing that timer from remote sensor one otherwise we do the same thing for remote sensor two now there's another function called send message we've seen this before it's identical we're just going to send the message out as a lora packet and this function get values gets the temperature and humidity values from the data variables. So basically we've got the variable coming in. We also have the time variable and we want to make certain that uh, we got fresh data and then we're going to display it. So we're going to get the current time. We're going to see if the time limit has been expired for sensor one. If the data is good, then we are just going to use our get data function to get the temperature and humidity data and assign it to remote temp one and a remote humid one. Otherwise, we're going to put question marks as the value for those, and that's because we've exceeded our timeout. We do the same thing for sensor two over here. Now, in the setup, it's uh, pretty simple. We're going to set up the serial monitor. We'll set up our SSD 1306 OLED display. Um, we're going to clear our display buffer and refresh the OLED with a bunch of X's, which you'll just see when you first boot up. Uh, the LoRa module uh, is set up the same way we did before. Again, make certain that you're using the correct frequency for your area. We'll set LoRa into on receive. Now in the loop, we're going to get the latest data values with that get values function we showed earlier and we'll print them to the screen. We'll update our OLED with those latest values and we'll delay three seconds to hold the display in the first mode. So the first mode, we have a zero over here that gives us uh, sensor one as big letters and sensor two as small. We'll hold that for three seconds. Then we'll send the remote message one um, a message to the remote sensor one excuse me just to get some val get some new values then we'll go into receive mode again um, we're going to refresh the display again with the new values this time we're going to put uh, sensor two on top because we have a one in the back here do the same thing wait three seconds then send the message out to remote two so this way we're staggering the messages we send out to the remote sensors by about three seconds so we have no conflicts over there and we also flip our display back and forth. So that's the code uploaded to the ESP32 and along with the remote sensors you can check it out and should have a working temperature and humidity sensor. And here's our remote temperature and humidity sensor system, all three units. We've got the controller up over here and the two remote units down here. And the controller, you'll notice, is built on that same solderless breadboard that I used earlier that is wide enough to accommodate both the ESP32 module that I used and my homemade LoRa module, which is down here and is working just fine. 
Now I'm going to separate the sensors to a more remote location. After all, that's what it's for. But I wanted to show you this just to show you the two LEDs on the sensor. Notice how they flash on and off in sequence. Now remember, these LEDs are illuminated every time that the sensor goes into a delay period to delay for two seconds to allow its DHT22 to reset. And so you'll notice that what is happening here is that the controller is pulling one of them and then it goes into its delay and afterwards the controller pulls the other one and it goes into its delay. So now that we've seen that, let's go and separate our sensors a little bit. And so now I've moved my remote temperature and humidity sensors to two different areas and I'm displaying them right now. By the way, that little rolling thing you see on the display, that's just an artifact of the video. In real life, that's not happening. Now, you'll notice that one of them has a pretty reasonable temperature. That's the sensor that's here in the workshop at 25.5 degrees Celsius. The other one looks very cold, negative 11.5 degrees Celsius. And no, that is not outside. Even though I live in Canada, it is August, and it doesn't get that cold in August. It will in the winter. The second sensor is in my deep freeze in the basement. And this is proving out a couple of things. First of all, it shows how the display handles negative temperatures. It has no problem with that. It also shows what happens when the display needs an extra digit, and it has no problem with that. And it also demonstrates that the LoRa transmission is capable of working even when the transmitter is inside a freezer, which of course has a metal case on it. So that's pretty impressive. And this system it could be used for anything, not just temperature and humidity. You could use a similar system to gather data from remote sensors and bring it into a central spot. And so this is a great application for LoRa. Now, one thing I didn't do in today's video was a LoRa distance test. I live in a suburban area, so the distances I could get with my setup probably wouldn't really pertain to the distances that you could get. Nonetheless, I was curious as to how far we were transmitting with some of the experiments we were doing today. So I took a USB power bank and hooked it up to the ESP32 and took it out for a walk to see how far I could get the signal. Now, I had no problem getting the signal anywhere in my home including the signal that was coming out of my freezer in the basement. So I went outside and I was absolutely amazed. I walked a full two blocks before the signal from the freezer in my basement started to drop off and the signal from the workshop in the basement was still going as strong as ever. And that's really incredible when you're considering I'm just using little wire antennas. So this is a really neat technology and you're going to be seeing more of it here in the DroneBot workshop. In fact, I'm working on another video that covers LoRa WAN, which is also a very important aspect of working and networking with LoRa. Now, if you want some more information about LoRa, there's an article that accompanies this video. You'll find a link right below the video, and you can grab all of the code that I used today for the experiments in that article. While you're on the DroneBot Workshop website reading the article, you can also sign up for the newsletter if you haven't already. It's not a sales letter. It's just my way of letting you know now and then what's going on here in the workshop. If you'd like to discuss LoRa, of course the best place to go for that would be the DroneBot Workshop Forum, where you'll find a whole bunch of like-minded individuals who'd be happy to help you with your projects and probably would love to discuss LoRa. And finally, if you haven't, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. I make videos about things not only LoRa, but microcontroller and electronics related, and I'm sure you'll enjoy them if you enjoyed this video. All you need to do to subscribe is hit that red subscribe button and if you can also hit that bell notification you'll get notified every time that I make a new video assuming of course that you've got notifications enabled in your web browser. So until we meet again the next time please take good care of yourself stay safe out there and I will see you soon here in the DroneBot workshop. Goodbye for now.